God is with you always through the good times and the bad. And we're so glad you're joining us on Hope today because we love to give you a dose of hope no matter what circumstance or situation you're in. We are always here to uplift you and we love you so much. I'm here with Tom and Anna. And Anna, we are going to take a deep dive into a conversation that is so important when it comes to the state of relationships. Yeah, I want to just say, well, first of all, we're so glad that you're with us on Hope today and also just how proud I am of our team here and that our producers allow us to talk about these conversations that can be very difficult. And today we want to bring hope for the marriage that has been ravished by betrayal, pornography, affair, or years of unhappiness. Our guest, who is a friend of mine in ministry, and I have so much respect for her, Dana Gresh, wants you to know your story isn't over. You can experience the love that endures every hardship she knows this from personal experience as she learned of her husband's sex addiction. Both she and her husband, Bob, have put in the individual hard work and she'll be sharing her story and how they found redemption for their marriage. There is hope in a situation where both, where if there's one that is in sin, owns that, and is repentant and works towards that healing, Tom. Well, and I think you said a key thing of puts in the hard work because yeah. a lot of times we, we want to ignore the problem or we're, we're not, if, if your pastor said, hey, next week, next Sunday, we're gonna talk about sex addiction, like <laughs> half the church would come the, the following week. But it's a, a conversation that needs to take place. And it's something that instead of letting things just go on and go on and go on and try little things, to, it's better to bring things to the light, uh, better to bring things to that hard work that needs to be done. And I'm glad we're talking about it. You know, we have to be real. There's a lot of marriages that have been struggling, you know, especially in, in wake of the pandemic. There's just so many relationships, so many people. I feel like we try to say like, oh, happy and be like, oh, everything's good. And we're all, everything's working out. But deep down, there's some serious issues. And so every marriage hits its bumps and its roads. There's a lot of people that go through these things. So maybe you're watching today and you're like, yeah, I can relate that I've experienced a betrayal or there's things going on in our, ma our marriage. And so we just want to take this time as just a moment just to encourage you, to uplift you and let you know that there is hope. And maybe today, that you are struggling in your marriage. And we always have our prayer line at any point during the show. Feel free to give us a call at 888-665-4483 because the one thing, Anna, that I know is that marriage is like that in the beginning, God created marriage and the enemy loves to fight against marriages, pull yeah. marriages apart because marriage is the pinnacle of where you see the love of Christ and the church. It's such a reflection. So yeah. I think there's no shame, you know, where the state of marriages are, but I think this is so important that we're having this conversation right. today. Absolutely. I think that we can, as Christians, we can get in this place where we feel like, gosh, Christians shouldn't have these very real struggles. And so we keep our issues in the dark. We don't go and seek help. And then we just continue in that cycle that is just so destructive. An interesting statistic, it is estimated that 60 to 72% of men in the church are sex addicts and 70% of wives of sex addicts experience some symptoms of PTSD. People are looking for hope, but many are trapped in a cycle that never resolves in recovery. Well, best-selling author and founder of Pure Freedom, Dana Gresh and her husband, Bob, say they have personally experienced the devastation, but now are stepping out to tell their story of hope and redemption for marriage. So Dana, it's so good to have you back with us on Hope Today. My pleasure, I love you guys. It's so good to be with you again. And before we dive into this conversation, I just wanna say publicly for all who's watching, um, Dana, I just wanna honor you and Bob for your courage, your vulnerability, your transparency to bring such a personal story out into the open with the heart purpose of wanting to set others free with your story. Um, and also, our, I also it's our just- honor. You know, Anna, the Lord, the word says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And there's not a single one of us walking with Jesus who haven't been set free from shame and sin and addiction of some kind. Maybe it's food, maybe it's shopping, maybe it's work. Um, for my husband, it was pornography. And for a, a very, not the minority, but the majority in the church, pornography is a cyclical habit in either the husband or the wife's life. And by every measure, 
of the world standards, that is addiction. And we need to start talking about it. The people that have been redeemed of it need to say so, so that those that are still in bondage can be set free by Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I thought that that statistic of 60 to 70, per, 72% of men in the church are sex addicts was astounding. Can you yeah. define for us what is a sex addict? Well, a, an addict of any type is someone who really is powerless over a habit that they really understand is destructive to them but whatever they do to try, they can't stop. Um, the Bible might call that a stronghold. And if you're more comfortable with that word, that's totally fine. But if you can't stop, if there's a cycle in your life, if you keep confessing a sin to someone, reaching out for accountability and help, but it just doesn't stop, you probably need some intervention beyond the friend next door. You need someone with some clinical understanding who will not back away from the Bible as their authority and the Spirit of God as the power that will release you from that. But you probably need someone with some clinical understanding. Right, absolutely. And before we get into your personal story, I do just wanna note that right at the very beginning of your book, you said that this book is for the woman who believes she is safe and hopes to rebuild trust and intimacy in her marriage after her husband has sinned. A key component of restoration is humble, authentic repentance and brokenness in your husband. You are not safe in your relationship if you are experiencing sexual, physical, and verbal abuse or repeated trauma from flagrant sin for which your husband is not repentant. If that's you, put this book down and call someone who help, will help you get into a safe place. And so it's, I just so appreciate that you note that um, as we dig into this conversation. So if you could um, share with us the story of you and Bob. Well, my husband came to me before we were married and told me that pornography was a problem for him and um, was just so convinced that as a virgin, when he started having sex, it would go away when we got married. And I meet so many couples who believe that lie. And pornography has almost nothing to do with real intimate sex. God created it to be a physical and emotional knowing. And pornography divorces the emotion from the component of sex. And, and really, the emotion is the point. To be connected and to know God, the Old Testament uses the word yada for sex, to know, to be known, to be deeply respected. It also uses that word yada to know God. It's about the intimacy. It's about the emotional connection. And Satan has used pornography to divorce the entire point of sex from the physical act. And so um, we faced that battle in the early years of our marriage, and my husband walked in great victory. But there came a point where he came to me. We sat in our red leather chairs in our living room, and he said, Baby, I've been trying to find my way back to the Lord and back to your heart without breaking your heart, but I can't seem to do it. I need to confess to you that the cycle of pornography and lust has returned in my life. And then he broke my heart totally devastated me, but the Lord has put us back together. He has redeemed us. And so, Dana, what were some of your first steps after that confession? Did you find steps that took you in the right direction or was there yeah. some hit and miss? Well, one of the the things for me that I have had an advantage of is, you know, I've immersed myself in sexual theology and helping the church heal from sexual brokenness for three decades. So I know this territory. And the first thing I did after Bob confessed to me is I went for a walk and I called a girlfriend. And many people don't don't tell someone. They hide in shame. They're embarrassed of their husband's behavior. They're embarrassed of their wife's behavior if she's the one that sinned sexually. And so they think, um, we can handle this. That's not true. Um, James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another and then you will be healed. Salvation and forgiveness comes from confessing our sins to God alone, okay? But he's given us the body for the work of healing. And there's nothing. Christianity is not a solo sport. You didn't come to Jesus on your own. Someone led you to him. You didn't get discipled in the disciplines of the faith alone. Someone led you to him. When you're in a spiritual crisis, when you're in a sin crisis, and pornography is sin, 
You need somebody in the body of Christ to take your hand and shepherd you. And what would you say to that woman who sought out maybe Christian counseling and she was told, well, just have more sex with your husband and then mm. it will help him be free of this. Like this is something that you can do as a wife to help him. You're just trying to tick me off today, right, Anna? <laughs> That's what you're doing. Okay, so um, I'll get on my soapbox here and say one more time that pornography and real sex have nothing to do with each other. Um, they are not the same thing. Pornography is a distorted, twisted version of what God created to bring a husband and wife into a one flesh relationship. And so more sex with your wife isn't going to fix that because that could be very non-intimate sex. Um, generally, a husband who has a pornography problem has an intimacy problem. And so they're not even having a lot of sex. That's a really real thing. But let me explain to you so that you can have some clinical understanding to strap onto your biblical truth and the power of the Holy Spirit, that a man who's in a cycle of pornography use has a very damaged brain. If you could take a, a functional scan of a man's brain who's healthy, you would see that it's very smooth. But a man who is caught in a cycle, and that might be every day, every hour, it might be once a week, it might be I hear a lot of once a month cycles. That too, you're gonna see that brain is pockmarked. It looks like Swiss cheese. You could actually put that brain next to a heroin addict and they're gonna look very similar. That's because dopamine washes over the brain when somebody uses pornography and um, just as it does with heroin. Dopamine is a feel good chemical, but it also has a very powerful impact on the brain. And for a heroin addict or a food sugar addict or um, a food addict, that dopamine will last for about an hour. But for a porn addict, it lasts five or six hours. That individual needs clinical intervention for the physiological unwellness in their body, as well as do not divorce it from the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You know, Dana, I mean, uh, I was going to ask you, why does it seem like so many men struggle with this? Because we see the statistics and we, we uh, uh, you know, know uh, how this has str caused struggles in, in marriages and in, in men's spiritual lives. But let me ask you about, you said clinical. And yeah. uh, sometimes uh, with, with guys, we think, well, I'll just talk to a friend. And, and there's some power in that, certainly. There's some strength in that but not like getting clinical help. Could you explain that a little bit more? When, when does that step need to take place? Anytime there's a cycle. And when that cycle is apparent, and I mean, we're talking with couples all the time. These men are repentant. They hate their sin. They love the Lord. They love their wives, but they cannot stop. That's because this is a chemical dependency and what started out as a sin problem has now become a brain problem. I don't know anybody who would be suffering from cancer and who's a Christian that wouldn't go to the church and be anointed with oil and prayed for for healing, but also would get themselves to the doctor for the physiological care that they need. And I think when your brain is in this kind of trauma, this kind of damage, you need someone who understands that, that can apply some of the um, components of um, behavioral science that is put in check with the word of God. Um, but let me say this, don't only rely on the clinical help, because if you look at the recovery world statistics, the recovery rates are in single digits outside of the power of the Holy Spirit, you aren't going to recover from this. And that is because it's a sin problem. And the only one capable of handling a sin problem is Jesus Christ. He is our redeemer. And a man who is caught in a cycle and a stronghold of pornography and sin that escalates out of that needs the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. Dan, I just love how you're breaking down just the clinical need to like handle when it comes to pornography addiction. And I just wanted to ask you from your personal experience or just somebody who's watching out there, because I know there's so many that can relate. How did you put boundaries in place in your marriage and then to get to that place of rebuilding intimacy? Because pornography does destroy so much trust in a relationship. So just want to know from your personal experience, what boundaries did you put in place? And when do you know it's sort of, it is time to re-enter into that place of intimacy? 
Yeah. So boundaries are something that God gives us right from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. He says, you know, this is the boundary. Um, don't eat that tree. Right. And then when they sin, he says, this is the boundary. You can't go into that garden. And then when it comes to marriage, he says, thou shalt not um, commit adultery. Thou shalt not fornicate. There are boundaries on our marriages and on sex. And when a marriage is compromised by unfaithfulness of any type, whether it's pornography or an affair, um, the, you need to sometimes implement special boundaries to restore the holiness and the sacredness of the marriage bed. And that's what happened in our marriage. Um, I had to get to a point where I sort of got detached, if you will, emotionally, less emotional about how I responded to Bob when he would confess to me. And I wrote a list of boundaries. I said, these are the boundaries. If you cross this line, the consequence will be, and I wrote down the consequence, and um, I had to enforce those consequences. And there were times when we weren't sleeping in the same room in our house. There was one point where he wasn't sleeping in the house. I had to get to that point because Bob's brain needed help. And I liken it to this. I have a very damaged disc in my back. And every now and then, Bob needs to help me walk because I can't do it by myself. Um, it's like that with your husband's brain when his brain is damaged by pornography. I have helped Bob walk by setting up boundaries. I've known many women who, Anna, you read that um, disclaimer in the beginning of my book, that if you're in a cycle of abuse where your husband continues to do whatever, um, you need to get help. And you may need to set a boundary such as, I am leaving, okay? I love marriage, I hate divorce, God hates divorce. And I, you and I have talked about this. It's a heartbreaking thing when somebody experiences that and it breaks God's heart. But if a woman is continually abused, sometimes, sometimes when she sets that boundary and says, if you continue to have this behavior, I'm leaving, that is the wake up call and the boundary that brings him to repentance. Yes. And what a joy it is to see that when yeah. that marriage is restored. Amen. And I just so appreciate too that you really speak of these hard boundaries that it's okay to set. Do not let anybody yeah. put shame on you for doing that or make you feel less than like this is for the protection of your heart and mind, your healing, his healing. And, um, so and the protection of the reputation of Jesus Christ, because marriage is a picture of the love of Christ for the bride. And so let's not forget that when we're setting these boundaries, we're, re we're protecting the reputation of the church and the reputation of the bridegroom, Jesus. Amen. And so would you recommend that the couple enter into marriage counseling or is it important that the woman get individual therapy and the man his own? Okay. So let me describe it this way. Um, I, for years, um, struggled through, just thinking Bob needs help, Bob needs help, Bob needs help. But my therapist said to me, well, Dana, if Bob was about to run, which Bob doesn't run except there's a bear chasing him, but if Bob was about to go for a jog and he was like stretching and you came around the corner and he like stretched his elbow right into your nose and it was bloody and it needed cauterized and Bob says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, baby, I didn't mean to hurt you. And you say, I forgive you, but your nose is still bleeding. Who needs to go to the hospital to get their nose cauterized? I do. It's like that when there's unfaithfulness in marriage, okay? 70% uh, of women whose husbands have had affairs or have, um, you know, pornography these days leads very quickly to an escalation of chat rooms, um, online cyber sex, things like that. Women who have experienced that have often symptoms of PTSD. And that doesn't mean they have PTSD. That means they're experiencing some brain trauma because they don't know what's real. They don't know what they can trust. And so they need to go get counseling on their own. He needs to get counseling on his own, and then they need to come together. And if you are like us, you might have to ask family members or the church for some financial help with that. But if you really want to be well, you will do that for your children, for your heart, for the generations behind you, and as I said, for the reputation of Jesus and his church. Yes, amen. So Dana, give us an update. What is the state of your marriage today? Oh. I'm, I'm about, mm, hold it together. Jesus has redeemed my man. He's not 
the same. He is a safe man. The man I prayed for has become the man I prayed with. He, there's not a night that he doesn't pray over me. The Bible says that a husband is supposed to wash his wife in the water of the word. Like I have that man now instead of the man who is acting like an addict. And um, I do believe, you know, it does take work. Tom, you said it takes work. This is a couple. You're looking at a woman who has stood beside her man. We have done the hard work of cooperating with God's spirit for redemption. And I can't emphasize enough that it takes God's spirit strengthening you to do that hard work, but he will if you ask him. Dana, that is good news, good to hear. What about the person who's watching right now? They feel lost. They don't, they don't know where to turn. They've maybe been down some roads of hope and, and had their heart broken again. What does that person do? Okay, I want to tell you what my girlfriend told me to do when I called her. When I got on the phone after Bob confessed to me, I went for a walk in the woods. I told my girlfriend. I wasn't even crying. I was such shock and trauma. And she said, Dana, his word is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. And how much light does a lamp give? Not a lot. Enough for the next step or the next three steps. Listen, we, we fight with different weapons as believers. Yes, we need clinical care, but we fight with different weapons. We do not fight without first the word of God to light our way every step of the way. We do not fight without the mind of Christ. Another woman who's hearing a confession doesn't have the mind of Jesus. She might go crazy, but the mind of Christ will release you from so many of the things that someone without Jesus won't. So listen, run to the word, run to someone who can guide you through the word and run to Jesus. That's such great counsel for those steps to take. And Dana, thank you again for your book. It's called Happily Even After let God redeem your marriage. You are a voice of hope. You and Bob just so much appreciate the heart that you bring. Thank you so much for being with us, Dana. My pleasure. Thank you, Anna. Well, here on Hope Today, we always love to bring you scripture to encourage your heart. As you just heard Dana say, it is a lamp unto your path. And uh, Tom, I believe you have the scripture I today. I do have the scripture, yes. Isaiah 41, 9 and 10, this is from the English Standard Version. It says, you, you who I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Wow, guys, I love this verse. It's ministered to me, it's ministered to others. I've used it in ministry, but this is the thing of, this is the God. If you put it in its context, I was reading in its context today, Sid, and it, it's even stronger. He's even stronger about how he will fight for us and how he called us and how he loves us. And, and, and we can, I'll tell you what, the world can try to wash that, that belief away from you. The devil can try to smoke and mirrors you out of that belief, but that is the God you serve. He fights for you. He upholds you with his righteous right hand. You know, Tom, as you were just speaking, I just saw this vision really quickly of there's a couple right now and I can just see you're watching and you are drowning. I just see you're in a big pool of water and you're like, like trying to like get <clears throat> gas for air and just know that God sees you struggling in the midst of your marriage. And sometimes I know that in marriages, it's just like sometimes you feel like you're drowning. You feel very overwhelmed. You feel like nobody sees you. Nobody hears you, but God sees you. And we just want to encourage you today. Maybe this has really hit home with Dana was sharing about with her husband, Bob, that your marriage right now is in peril. Your marriage is about to like it's at its breaking point. And the greatest thing that we know is that when we cry out to God, when we reach out to him, when we have community around us, when we get the help that we need, God does heal. So maybe you are that wife, you're that husband today, that you are at the end of your rope and you don't know how God is going to save your marriage, how God is going to intervene. The first thing to do is just surrender and just know that his hand 
can reach down to the lowest valley, to the deepest of pits. And God will place community around you. God will place people around you so that you can see him rework and tra change your marriage. Sometimes, Anna, the one thing I've just seen with like friends and even my own experiences, God will allow to break you and to like cause certain things to happen so that he can heal and put you back together the way that he intended it for it to be. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And also, I just love that this scripture says to fear not, do not be dismayed. And when we are in a marriage that has these patterns, these toxic behaviors, the sin, that we can get in, so stuck in fear that we won't reach out for help. We won't, we start to, it like affects our brain. Even Dana was saying how there's PTSD and we start to feel a little crazy. We wonder if we're making a big deal out of it. Let me tell you, you are not making a big deal. And also don't be afraid to step out. Don't be afraid to put those hard boundaries in place because you know, fight for your marriage. We wanna believe that God is going to restore it. He's going to redeem it but also for the one out there who is not seeing that transformation in your husband, know that God is still for you. He is still fighting for you, your heart, your mind, your healing, your life. And if that, if that end game is not restoration, know that you're still gonna be okay. As long as you draw close to Christ, as long as you receive his healing and keep yourself placed at his feet, friend, you have nothing to fear. There is life on the other side and we'll pray that it is for your marriage, but also know that there's life for you regardless. Uh, you know, I just wanna say, I don't wanna miss a couple of things that are real important. Yes, it's great to have friends to talk to, you need that. You need to take care of yourself as well. It's great to have pastors and it's great to have accountability partners, but clinical help is really necessary sometimes. Be sure to get that as well. Definitely the help is needed. And so we just want to encourage, you know, one thing I just love is that in the Bible, that did you know God, he says that he is first our husband. He is the first, the one that we look to. And so today we just encourage you to look to him, put your eyes on him and lay your burden down because there you'll find him. Have a great day. On tomorrow's Hope Today, discover how to be set free and released from the damage of trauma. Pastor and author Jay Otis Ledbetter offers advice to those who are struggling from the pain of trauma as he provides biblical insight that will help you find freedom. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.